A big story in the news cycle this week is a recent interview with Joe Rogan and Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who happens to be the chief medical correspondent over at CNN. He's also a board certified neurosurgeon and teaches neurosurgery at Emory School of Medicine. And I think this conversation, you know, some of the clips that you've been hearing about really depict the conversation as being sort of violent and volatile, and there's a lot of spreading of so-called misinformation. But I think Joe really nailed this conversation. And although it is a long conversation, it's about three hours, what I did is I accumulated and curated five clips that I think really epitomize and help us to all get better answers and clarity about the nuances and the gray area to a lot of questions that, that we all have. Like, what are we, what should we do for our kids? What about this endemicity? Like this virus is endemic. It's not going away. So that sort of changes the conversation and causes us to then, or it should cause us to reprioritize our health. A message that, of course, you know, my bias, we've been talking about promoting health. We've been critical of the fact that no health officials, the, no president, no prime ministers, like virtually no one on network television has been promoting exercise, has been promoting walking, has been talking about the fact that in the end, COVID-19 is a vascular disease and people can exacerbate or worsen their cardiovascular disease by partaking in unhealthy living. And that we sh that that is the root cause of the problem. So we're gonna start out with this clip because Joe does just a phenomenal job of pinning down Dr. Gupta to talk about this. Now, here's what I expect of Dr. Sanjay Gupta. So if he does see this, I expect him to include this into his narrative on CNN to start saying, hey, look, you know, to CNN and, and you know, Time Warner and AOL Time Warner that owns uh, CNN, I believe, to say, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't have like Chick-fil-A and McDonald's and uh, processed food companies advertising on our network. You know, maybe we should be promoting healthy living instead of just demonizing people who choose not to wear face masks when they go to the park. Like, like that's become the narrative here is like masking versus non-masking. It's all these false dichotomies. We're just doing circles and we're arguing over two things that honestly probably aren't going to move the needle. And, and in fact, as Dr. Gupta says, this virus is not going away. This is endemic. It's here to stay. It's not going to disappear. So the onus should be on you. And, and the Fauci's and the experts should be saying, you need to walk or here's what I do to stay healthy. Here's what I am doing. We should be interviewing Joe Rogan. He should be on CNN saying, okay, Joe, wow, you're, you're 54 and you had one bad day. Okay. What did you do? Well, we should be promoting this to other baby boomers and people that are in their 60s and 70s, right? Like, should we not? And anyway, Joe gets into this. I think he does a great job. So let's hear from Joe Rogan. When you say long-term symptoms, what do you think is going on there? Mm. Is this a result of overall poor health in general, lack of vitamin supplementation and exercise and uh, just a, a robust immune system and just a person who's eating poorly, sedentary lifestyle, like what is causing their body to have this sort of reaction where some people get through it quite easily? Mm. Young people in yeah. particular, like my children. Yeah. My children got through it. It was like the worst was like, it was like a day. And my other one had a headache for right. a day. I, and I, and I, you know, thankfully I think mo most people are that way, right? I, yeah. And when I say most, I mean, you know, even among adults, 80%. Probably. Right. So should we be making decisions based on the small amount of people that have these long-term sy symptoms and not instead addressing why did these individuals have these long-term symptoms? And is this something that's inherent to their own biology, their own lifestyle choices? Is that what the consequences are coming from? Or is it coming from this very serious disease? Like, shouldn't we look at it in terms of what does this do to healthy people? Mm -hmm. And if these people are not healthy, what can we do to make them healthy so mm -hmm. that they could have a more robust immune system and a more, uh, you know, a more favorable outcome? I, I, Instead I, of just thinking we should vaccinate kids. Well, I mean, all kids. Why can't we do both? Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. He said we should be doing both. So, with all due respect, Dr. Gupta, I have not heard you talk about doing both. You. And in fact, your bias came through on this entire conversation. You've been only focusing on one thing, vaccination, vaccination, washing hands, masking. Okay. That's what you've been talking about for the last 19 months. With all due respect, you haven't been promoting both. You've been promoting one thing. Now, it turns out that by doing both, when you exercise, you actually improve the efficacy and the post-vaccination response. So the people in the pro-vaccine camp and the people who feel so comfortable going to restaurants and gyms now that they're requiring passports, they should be encouraging people to get healthy before they get jabbed. I mean, they should be the most excited. But oftentimes, 
they're the ones that don't even exercise, which is so paradoxical because you're like, dude, the, the body's immune response is what determines the immunity. And if you have a crappy immune system because you're burning it down with hyper palatable, ultra processed sugar and crap, and you're, I have a story for you, I'm going to tell you, share with you in a moment here, um, then what are you doing? You're, you're, you're not getting the best value, especially because I can't even go there here on YouTube, but we know that the protection seems to wane over time. And if we're really concerned about saving lives, we should be encouraging healthy living to prevent some of the waning of the protection over time that is now being demonstrated by the New England Journal of Medicine, by a recent preprint in the UK. So that's, I'm going to leave that there because we're on YouTube. And of course, they've been pretty serious about um, where they stand on these conversations. So again, Dr. Gupta, I expect you because you said we should be doing both to talk about both. I expect your employer now, because the, you are their chief medical correspondent, to be recommending both. I'm not going to hold my breath because we know how these things work, but it's important that we that we talk about this because everyone talks about we should do both. We can do both. We can wear a mask and we can promote healthy living, but they never promote healthy living. They only talk about the masks and the hand sanitizer and the distancing and the closing of businesses, it, which is weird to me, Okay. Um, so let's talk about uh, the 80-20 principle. You know Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule or the 90-10 rule? Well, it turns out, and Joe does a phenomenal job of extracting this from Dr. Gupta. And again, this is from a network that in my opinion, and according to a lot of people, have completely overestimated the realistic health ramifications correlated with this particular pathogen and the realistic risk for most people. As Dr. Gupta says right here, this virus adheres to the 80-20 principle. 80% 80 of infections are mild or even asymptomatic. But you never hear that directly from CNN. Remember, they have the ticker counter. They have how many people have died. They have the hospitalizations, ICU bed capacity, the whole thing. Like they're sh sharing the scariest of the scary when in fact, that's only a small subset of all the people who are infected. So here we go with Dr. Gupta. The risk of getting severe disease was four to five times higher. Yeah. If you if you were obese, yeah. so we we this is a big problem. And but and why don't we encourage people? We need. To, well, yeah. why is there all this talk of just go and get vaccinated? And we, why isn't the president? Why isn't the press secretary? Why isn't all these major news? Why are they saying if they all they have to say get vaccinated? That's all. That's all you ever hear. Why, why isn't there? You've got to take care of your body. They, it's they, the it's the front line. And not just for COVID, but the frontline defense for everything that ails us. I think that um, it's been an issue for a long time. It remains an issue. It needs to be addressed. I think when you're dealing with an acute crisis in the middle of a pandemic, hundreds of thousands of people have died. It's not to say don't get healthy, not saying, hey, ignore that. But that's not going to take care of the problem as rapidly as you know, being able Correct. to stop the transmission but of this, this virus. Is, it's not like there's only been one press conference. No, look, look. There's it's... been thousands of discussions and almost no discussion of the fact that 78% of the people that wind up in, in the hospital for COVID are obese, yeah, right? Yeah, I think, I think uh, right. And and 113% in the ICU and whatever. There, it's, it's a 113%. much more likely... To How end do you up, get a more than no, no, 113% more likely to oh, end up versus oh. those. But... Yeah, this needs to be addressed. Like Joe, we, we spend $4 trillion a year on healthcare in this country. 70% of the diseases are probably totally preventable. And most lifestyle. of that is lifestyle. Yeah. And most of that even more specifically is diet. So I think we there's always been, again, going back to the nuance of these discussions, people say, hey, look, you know, we can't shame people who are obese. And, and no, nobody's saying shame people who are obese. You're saying there's a real problem in this country. If we spent 1% of our healthcare budget on actually helping people get fit and making sure had healthy food and whatever it may be, it would go a long way. We the don't, problem we don't do that. This expression, you can't shame people is that it's been distorted down to the point where even bringing up the fact that someone is obese is shaming them. And that is ridiculous. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what gets in the way. Yeah. And, and it doesn't need to get in the way of this. We can have a, a, a good, smart discussion about this. And doctors yeah. and nurses, they need to be talking about this stuff with their patients. So again, I thought that clip was great because you have a doctor who's been promoting, you know, participating in some of the fear mongering and over exaggerating some of the realistic health concerns for a lot of people. And he goes on to say that, yeah, there's big issues like being overweight and obese and having prediabetes and diabetes 
that we haven't talked about. And it's a major problem. And he goes on to talk about the different countries and how rich, wealthy, Western type countries, you know, whether it's, you know, the US or Canada, the UK, they are faring much more poor, or much more poorly compared to countries who don't have the resources because those countries have healthier, leaner people. They don't have the widespread, they might have more, you know, sort of uh, infectious diseases and challenges in that regard, but they do not have the pr propensity of chronic diseases. Now we're going to get into this premise that I think Dr. Gupta, again, I'm not trying to be too critical of him, although he does tell a little white lie. We're going to get to that in a moment, but he promotes this idea that we've been talking a lot about that COVID-19 is a vascular disease. Now I want to get into that and talk about that research, but first I want to welcome you all back. If you're enjoying this content, please hit that like button, leave us a comment below. I'm Mike Mutzel. I'm very grateful that you're tuning in here. Also, I do want to let you know, you know Joe did mention vitamins and exercise and all of these things. One vitamin that's very important to consider this time of year is vitamin D because we know that the sun is actually getting lower and lower in the sky, especially if you live south of Atlanta, Georgia, here in the U.S. You know, this, what's called the zenith angle of the sun is insufficient, even if you get ample sun exposure, to induce cutaneous synthesis of pre-vitamin D. So guess what? You need to get it from food. So if you're not regularly eating cod liver, if you're not regularly eating some of the foods that have really trace amounts of vitamin D, you should invest a small amount of your paycheck into vitamin D supplements. So over at our sister company, Myoscience, we have a range of solutions in every different delivery system. If you like soft gels, we got you covered. If you like vegetable capsules, we have you covered. If you like gummies for your kids, we have a solution for you and also a liquid solution, which is, by the way, the most affordable. So you can support your family's vitamin D levels and vitamin D health by going over to Myoscience using the coupon code PODCAST to save on your favorite delivery system of vitamin D. I personally recommend the essential fatty nutrients because it has vitamin D and its partner in crime, vitamin K, in its MK7 form of vitamin K2. So those nutrients work synergistically, kind of like you know Batman and Superman together. They work together to help support uh, whole body health. So again, you can use the coupon code podcast over at myoscience.com. Now let's get into this premise and we're going to hear about a little white lie that I, I don't think is very little. I think it's something we should point out here with Dr. Gupta um, about myocarditis and kids, but first talk about why kids might be, uh, why, why we're hearing about in the media, kids getting hospitalized from COVID. What is that? Well, it turns out that COVID-19 scientists at Scripps University and other universities and Dr. Gupta does a great job. Give him lots of credit for talking about this over and over in the podcast. It's a vascular disease. That study on the spike protein um, that they did at the Salk Institute, I'm yep. sure you're aware yep. of that. Yep. That showed the spike protein is responsible for the deterioration of blood vessels. Yeah. That that, that this is. I mean, the salk, and they were the same ones who who then think classify this potentially as a vascular yes. disease as yeah. opposed to a respiratory disease. For that very reason, they think that there's these these uh, receptors that are really you know predominantly in your blood vessels that do get you know that the spike protein is binding to. Yeah. So th there was a study that just came out basically saying you know frankly reminding people that when you inject you should aspirate you got to aspirate a little bit yeah. make sure you don't get blood back and yeah. and uh, and then be able to to inject directly into the muscle. Is there a specific site that's more conducive to a straight muscle than to hitting a, a vein or a blood vessel or is it just dumb luck? Um, you know, when you're injecting into them, you're not, you know, you obviously got big blood vessels around. So obviously right. you have to avoid those within the muscle itself. You may have smaller blood vessels, small veins, small capillaries. And so is it just luck whether or not the vaccine gets into those? Into the blood vessel? Yes. I mean, that would be bad if it, if it got into those. So, you know, you, that you're supposed to aspirate a little bit to not have that happen. It's unusual for it to happen, but I think that there might be something to that. There's a study that just came out, I think over the last couple of days showing that there may be some concerns about more adverse effects in people who had it injected directly into their bloodstream. We're just now recognizing that severe COVID-19 is more of a vascular disease than a respiratory disease. So we should be treating it as such, encouraging exercise, encouraging walking, encourage people do resistance training two days per week, getting good sleep. Just a few nights of bad sleep can raise your blood pressure. They can alter the circadian rhythms of your body's natural blood pressure and, and you know, water retention pathways and the whole renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the RAS system. There's so many things going on here. Um, you know, sauna therapy, movement. And so here's a great picture to share with your friends and family. Hey, you're so worried about COVID-19. You're so worried about ending up in the hospital or dying. Then you should be very concerned about the health of your cardiovascular system. You should be walking. You shouldn't be having sugar in an airplane, which by the way, Dr. Gupta did mention there that nurses and doctors should be 
promoting and, and, and encouraging weight loss, right, in their patients, the obesity prevalence amongst healthcare pr practitioners is the same as a general population. Friends, I can't tell you this enough times. I've been in medical sales for 12 years, okay? I've delivered lunches to major holistic, integrative, preventative medical clinics. I've had office managers come to tell me, Mike, your lunches are too healthy. I'm like, excuse me? Like, you have write-ups about how you prevent disease in like major local magazines and you're telling me my high-protein, low-carb, high-fat lunch, like I would bring avocado, grass-fed meat, even a bag of gluten-free chips sometimes and water, and I was told my lunch is too healthy for the clinic. I, I'm not even, I'm, I wish I was kidding, okay? Because you know what the drug reps, I would all often cross paths with drug reps. They would order Domino's pizza, Kentucky Fried Chicken, they were bringing donuts, they were bringing Jimmy John's, Subway. For, it was the, the bottom of the barrel food. And guess what? The doctors would eat it. The nurses, the MAs, they would all eat this crap. I mean, it's incredible, okay? So friends, if you're an overweight health practitioner, or an allied health professional, you're not going to inspire your patients to make the necessary diet and lifestyle choices they need to become more healthy if you don't resemble health. None of us are perfect. I'm certainly not perfect, okay? However, I do my best every day, and I share with you what I'm doing, and a lot of people do, to be healthy, to be physically fit, to be able to go out and, and hike 10 miles and be fine, to go lift weights, to fast for a day. You should be resilient, especially if you're in the healthcare field or allied health field. So here's some visuals here on ways that you can improve your endothelial health because in the end, severe COVID-19 is a disease of the vasculature, the blood vessels, uh, the endothelial system. Okay, so this I think is a little bit of a white lie. So Joe catches Sanjay trying to say that the background level of post-infection myocarditis in children is the same as it is in adults. And he catches them and he nails them. So uh, again, I don't know why he would do that. As a, as a professor of neurosurgery and a chief medical correspondent, he should know better. I, I, I don't know why he brought out this piece of paper. So here we go. The like risk-reward proposition there is but, very clear. No, no. But, but I'm just saying that if I say, hey, look, I'm worried about myocarditis. Okay. Let's say that's the thing. Um, let's just take that as an example. Okay. What is the likelihood I'm going to have myocarditis from the vaccine versus myocarditis from the disease? It seems like the likelihood, according to that study, for young boys age 12 to 15 is far more likely to get myocarditis from the vaccine than you are from COVID. There's, there's not a lot of kids who go to the hospital for COVID. You're right about that. And myocarditis is a risk. But myocarditis is more common in those who get the disease. Well, according to that study, I it's know, not. I according know. to that study, it's. But you're saying it. But you're ignoring I, the science no, no, that I they're can, presenting. No. They're so, they're showing that, that, that you're that, more likely to get myocarditis at a large number, four to six times more likely. They're not saying myocarditis. They're they're saying they're, it's it's then be hospitalized with COVID. Hospitalized with COVID. Right. Okay, push the put that up again. It's saying you're four to six times more likely to get myocarditis than to be hospitalized from COVID. I will take a closer look at this, but I- You're in, I, but you have an impulse uh, well, to, um, to defend well, let the me, vaccination in light of this data. Let, let, can, I, can I pull out something sure, here? Sure. Because I, I, have, I have been thinking about this a lot. You know, I mean, I got teenage kids and we, we looked a lot at the, the myocarditis data overall, so- But that is saying that you're four to six more likely to so, get myocarditis than you are to be hospitalized for COVID for any reason at all. Yeah, so here, here is the, here's the myocarditis data specifically, which showed that it was a 16 times higher risk of myocarditis among patients with COVID-19 as compared to the vaccine right, 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 itself. Right, 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 right. But this is among all patients. This you could have 90-year-old pa people. They, they, they count as patients, right? Yeah. You're talking about, we're specifically talking about 12 to 15-year-old boys. What I was saying to you is your confidence the in not worrying about catching COVID because you're a healthy guy and because you've been vaccinated. So you catching an infection of a highly novel virus, which is a real thing, you're less worried about that because of your circumstances. What I'm saying because is- I'm, Because I have immunity. These young boys will breeze through this thing for the most part. You know that, right? I think most, most young of them would be people, totally fine. Most young people breeze through it, including my own children, breeze through it. Yes. So again, that's a little disappointing. Uh, we'll just say that that was a his moral compass was a little off when he pulled out that paper and tried to make the the big leap in saying that the risk of post infectious myocarditis in children is the same as it is in adults, which is completely not true. Here is data from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Remember, friends, that. 
out of 75 million kids in the US over the last 20 months, only 16,000 have been hospitalized. Now that might sound like a lot. You're talking, do the math, 16,000 divided by 75 million. Uh, it's such a small number, it, it's not even significant on your phone. And the percentage of all hospitalizations from COVID, children only comprise 2.2% of those. Uh, the rate of, of hospitalization is 0.9%. So the background level of post-infectious myocarditis for kids is not the same number as it is for adults. It's just not. That is a little white lie. And I'm, I'm disappointed that Dr. Gupta brought that up. I, I hope he retracts that statement. No, so here's the deaths, again, if your child died, it would be devastating. But we know, friends, we're seeing an inc a slight increase in the death percentage and rate in children from, you know, they, they used to comprise 0.06% of the deaths. Now it's like more towards 0.09% of all the deaths. You might wonder, well, that's probably because the virus is changing. My argument is that we know that obesity rates have increased. We know that when you're more overweight, there's more collateral damage to your endothelial cells. And we know that your endothelial cells, which, which are part of your vasculature system comprise the microvasculature. They're the functional unit um, uh, in, in your body. They're compromised by being overweight. And we know the rate at which kids are gaining weight increased. It doubled. It more than doubled. We shared that on recent videos. Go and check that back out in, in the upload feed here on, on you know, YouTube and iTunes. This was Journal of the American Medical Association. This was also the CDC's own website. Looking, I think, at 1.2 million um, hospital, or I'm sorry, BMI measurements in children from Kaiser Permanente data. So this is corroborated uh, in various different ways. Kids are more overweight now than they've ever been, ever in history. So why are we surprised that more and more kids are getting hospitalized or having severe disease, okay? Yeah, that could be due to the viral load of the, uh, the, the, the infectious nature of the Delta variant. Sure, that could be a part of it. But I think it's you're foolish if you pretend that it's only because of the Delta variant. And it's not that we've made kids more unhealthy because we have. They're more overweight. They're more sedentary, right? We, we canceled school and sports. And parents have been so, you know, helicopter parenting of these kids. They haven't, um, you know, let, let kids play. They're afraid to let kids go outside. Okay, so now let's talk about the, the fact that this virus is not going away. So here was a little cognitive dissonance that I had throughout this conversation. On the one hand, Dr. Gupta acknowledges natural immunity and he acknowledges, and I believe he says it right here, that this virus is not going to go away. It's never going away. It's endemic, okay? Remember, we shared uh, you know, articles about this from Nature Magazine and Nature is a very reputable journal. Um, they talk about that this virus is endemic, yet he, he continues to pretend that he's never going to get exposed to this and he doesn't want his kids to get exposed to, to this. That's like, that's a, that's a utopian, unrealistic expectation, friends, this is endemic. That's like saying, oh, I hope I never come in contact with influenza. No, that's not the way to look about it. You got to say, I want to make my body so resilient that if I get in contact with this, I'm going to have a low viral load and not long lasting complications. That's the way we view this. Not pretending that we're going to avoid this and skirt this thing and skirt exposure forever. Like, I feel like we could bring this pandemic under control, not extinguish it completely. Probably this virus is here to stay but we could bring it under control. Especially if we're promoting immunizations to kids or to, to, to everyone and boosters for everyone. We also need to simultaneously be promoting healthy living because that can make these, these interventions probably last a little bit longer. But uh, anyway, here's a study here that showed that the risk of heart disease formation and atherosclerosis in young children starts at the age of two. This is an old paper. It's been known since 1998 that cardiovascular disease starts at the age of two, friends. Okay, so again, we canceled school. We kept kids home. We do all that. Okay, now, another thing that that's many other people have been talking about, how U.S. is one of the few sort of developed countries that promotes freedom and individual responsibility and all of this that doesn't consider natural immunity as a thing. They don't even, we don't even acknowledge it, okay? Um, there's only one form of immunity and has nothing to do with being natural, so to speak. Uh, and so there was an article here in the British Medical Journal that talked about this, like, hey, why are we ignoring this when we know that the odds of a breakthrough case versus a reinfection are much higher? You're much more likely to have a breakthrough case versus get reinfected if you've had a prior infection. So Joe goes on to, to talk about this and Dr. Gupta agrees. Okay, Dr. Gupta, I expect you to be reviewing the Israeli research here to talk about reinfection rates versus breakthrough rates. So here we go. They're ignoring that and forcing these people to comply with this mandate. Why do you think they would do that? And does that piss you off? I, this one surprises me. 
I, 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 it does. I, it, because, first of all, just historically, we do know that people who have natural immunity, it can be very effective immunity. I'm talking even pre-pandemic, you know. Yeah. Even SARS, going back to 2003. People of 18 years later. Yes, that's right. There's evidence immunity. of immunity. Yes. So, I mean, this is not like, whoa, we should be blown away by this. This was kind of a known entity. It's normal. I think what has surprised me a bit about it is that um, we still don't do enough testing to really know for sure uh, if people actually have the immunity. People say they've had COVID, so they should have antibodies. Some of these antibody tests are pretty good. Some are not, you know. So it's it's weird that two years into this that we still don't have good, we don't we still don't have good vision on just how much immunity we have. Well, he goes on to talk about you know we don't have really good standardized testing. We should have more available antigen testing versus antibody testing. And look, I'll just say that you know you take what he says there, and then you look at the press releases for some of the companies that manufacture these um, these interventions. And the press release focuses just on the antibodies. So we can't have it both ways, right? We, we, one, if one thing is true in one instance, that it also needs to be true for the other instance. And these labs like LabCorp and Quest, they're doing semi-quantitative antibody measurements to IgG and also the nucleocapsid. You know, I don't know that they have any methodolo methodological challenges. This is what the initial New England Journal of Medicine reports and the safety studies looked at. They looked at the same using the same assay. Now we also have the T-cell immunity assay. I've shared with you that results. Uh, I, I did that on myself. It's very easy to do. You can go to t-detect.com. I make no money off this whatsoever, but I want you to be able to test for immunity because I get it. A lot of people think, oh, I had a bad cold. I must have had COVID. Oftentimes it wasn't COVID. It was like the flu or whatever. So I understand where he's going here. But I also recognize that there's a lot of people that have a confirmed positive case, right? Whether it's a nasal swab, antibodies, uh, antigen test, rapid antigen, whatever. And no one seems to care. No businesses. But they're probably the safest to be around at this point, right? If you're concerned about COVID and dying and the whole thing, then, then you're really safe being around someone who had been infected and is recovered. We shared with you the data, the 13-fold lower odds of a, of a, of a <laughs> reinfection versus a breakthrough, right? We talked about that data at length, that this is real stuff here. Um, but for whatever reason, the politicians don't, don't talk about that. Now, a clip that I didn't want to play, it was about 45 minutes into this. You know, Joe really pins down uh, Dr. Gupta again and says, hey, were you surprised that two FDA top officials that are in the vaccine division in terms of regulating and approving vaccinations uh, resigned as a result of the White House announcing prematurely that they're going to rule out booster shots for all of Americans? Because they were the first, you know, the White House said that first, even before the data had been reviewed or looked at or submitted. So um, that I think was interesting. There's a lot of, this is a really good show, my friends. If you're into health and you have the time, listen to it this weekend. I think you'll find some of these clips that I found helpful, but there's additional parts of the conversation that hopefully you get some value from. It's it's not super combative. You know, they do talk a lot about, a lot about the ivermectin and all that. I'm not even going to get into that because I'm sure you've seen that. But hopefully you found these clips helpful. If you did, you can hit that like button. Thank you for checking out the show notes. I will link some of the things we talked about and the resources and articles and so forth on heart disease and kids and all that uh, below. But anyway, I always like to share with you stuff that I find interesting and I thought you would find these conversations and clips helpful and we will catch you on a future video up down the road. Bye now.